Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Let me start this video by posing a question. Let's suppose you go outside right now and run as fast as you can for as long as you can down the street. What's going to happen to the rate of breathing? Well, it doesn't take long before your breathing rate goes skyrocketing up. Okay? And not only does your rate of breathing increase, but the depth of breathing also increases. Okay? When you run like that, you're not going to have shallow breathing, but actually you're going to have very deep breathing, and then the rate is going to be increased. The most noticeable thing is actually the increase in the rate of breathing. But do you have to think about that? For example, when you're running, do you really have to consciously increase the rate and depth of breathing? That would be kind of bad if you did, because you know, you're playing a sport, that's one more thing to think about. It turns out that your body automatically does this. And the reason your body is able to do this is because it's sensitive to carbon dioxide levels. And really we're talking about the PCO2, that is the partial pressure of CO2 in the blood. So if you went out and you ran as fast as you could, your muscles are being worked very hard. And muscles are highly metabolically active tissues, they'll start producing a lot of carbon dioxide. Okay? So if you go out and run, initially you're going to see a rise in the production of carbon dioxide. But carbon dioxide can't be allowed to stay in the blood because it will acidify the blood. Carbon dioxide equals hydrogen ions. And if you acidify the blood too much, you've got serious problems. So the way that you get rid of that CO2 is by changing the rate and depth of breathing. And the way you get rid of that CO2 is by breathing faster and deeper. Okay? So this is called altered breathing. So altered breathing generally occurs in response to changes in the PCO2. And altered breathing involves a change in the rate and depth of breathing. Now, here's the important point here. The most important stimulus for changing breathing levels, that is the rate and depth, is the level of PCO2 in the blood. That is the partial pressure of CO2. If you have more CO2 in your blood, you need to get rid of that CO2, and so the way you do that is by breathing faster and harder. Now, generally speaking, the blood levels of PCO2 are maintained within a fairly narrow window of about 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. But if you increase that PCO2 by just 5 millimeters of mercury, that's enough to double the respiratory rate. Okay? And again, if you're increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood, it would make sense to, to increase the respiratory rate because you have to get rid of that CO2. So it's a little bit unintuitive. We normally think of oxygen as being so important. Oxygen is important. Of course, we need oxygen. But oxygen is actually not the stimulus for changing your rate of breathing. It's actually carbon dioxide. Now, on the next slide, we're going to go into the mechanism of altered breathing. I have this bullet point down here. I really should clarify this by saying altered breathing that's for reasons other than just a simple change in PCO2 can actually result in things like hyperventilation and hypoventilation. These things don't normally happen. These are abnormal conditions. Okay, When you go out and you are exercising and you start breathing harder, that's not hyperventilation. Hyperventilation is more if you're having an anxiety attack or a panic attack. Okay? So these are not normal conditions and not good. So this I should clarify, altered breathing for reasons other than simply PCO2. I'll worry about changing that to a subscript later, but hopefully that makes sense. Altered breathing by definition is simply when the rate and depth of breathing changes in response to changes in PCO2 levels. And the way this actually occurs is when the respiratory center in the brainstem, so the medulla oblongata has this thing called the respiratory center, and the respiratory center will actually receive sensory input from chemoreceptors. These chemoreceptors are sensitive to uh, the level of acid in the blood. Okay. One important thing to remember, this is very important, is this carbonic acid bicarbonate buffering system. Now technically all of this is in equilibrium with each other, but notice if you combine carbon dioxide and water, they will actually chemically react to form this substance called carbonic acid, which will then dissociate into bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. So therefore, if you have a buildup of carbon dioxide, that will actually force the production of more H+. 
Therefore, carbon dioxide acidifies the blood, and that is very important to remember. If there's elevated carbon dioxide, there's going to be elevated hydrogen ions. And you can also look at it the reverse. If there's elevated hydrogen ions, that's an indirect measure of the amount of carbon dioxide. So there's two kinds of chemoreceptors that monitor the levels of CO2 in the blood. Those are central chemoreceptors and peripheral chemoreceptors. Now, they're going to be in different locations, but they're pretty much just going to have the same functions. Central chemoreceptors, as I mentioned, are in the brainstem, specifically the medulla oblongata, and they monitor the pH of cerebrospinal fluid. Now again, they're monitoring pH directly, not the carbon dioxide levels. However, if the pH is low, that means that you've got an elevated level of hydrogen ions, because remember, pH is a negative scale, so low pH means high hydrogen ions. And then if you have high hydrogen ions, you have high CO2. So the central chemoreceptors are going to use the pH as an indirect measure of the blood CO2. So if you have an acidic blood, so elevated hydrogen ions, that means you have elevated uh, carbon dioxide levels. And again, that CO2 is able to diffuse from the blood into the cerebrospinal fluid, and that's how the, cer the central chemoreceptors are able to detect the H plus levels, because that CO2 can move into the cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, So what's going to happen is, when the central chemoreceptors sense that there's elevated hydrogen ions, they're going to send uh, signals to the respiratory center in the medulla oblongata, which is going to stimulate faster breathing and increase the depth of breathing. So it's going to increase the respiratory rate. Remember that if you have changes in the PCO2, that is an increase just by 5 millimeters of mercury, that's enough to double the respiratory rate. Okay? And so let's think about this. If you go out and you do a sprint down the street for as long as you can and as hard as you can, you're having a high metabolic rate in your uh, skeletal muscles in particular. They're generating a lot of carbon dioxide. And by this equation that you should know, when you have high carbon dioxide, you have high hydrogen ions. And again, those chemoreceptors, such as the central chemoreceptors in the brainstem, they sense that elevated hydrogen ions. And that means that hydrogen ion levels are high. The pH is low. It's acidic. So that high hydrogen ion level is going to be sensed by the central chemoreceptor, and those central chemoreceptors in the brainstem are going to send impulses to the respiratory centers in the medulla oblongata, which basically tell the lungs to double their respiratory rate, or at least increase it. Okay? Increase both the rate and depth of breathing. Now what does that accomplish? Well, if you're breathing harder, and you're breathing faster, you're going to be able to eliminate more carbon dioxide, which is what you want. Okay, So you produce more CO2, you need to get rid of more CO2. Okay, Now, in the process of increasing the respiratory rate, you do bring in more oxygen. That's true. But oxygen normally is not the stimulus for increasing or decreasing respiratory rate. Okay, It's simply carbon dioxide. Also note there are peripheral chemoreceptors. These are chemoreceptors. We find some in the aortic arch, and then some are in the carotid bodies. Um, these basically function the same way as the central chemoreceptors, except instead of monitoring cerebrospinal fluid, these just simply measure the blood pH. Okay? Um, and their stimulus is also uh, the hydrogen ions, as it was in the central chemoreceptors. So when you have an acidic blood, so low pH, they sense high degree of hydrogen ions, which tells them carbon dioxide levels are elevated. And so you'll have the same result. Peripheral chemoreceptors stimulate the respiratory center to increase the respiratory rate of the lungs. And this is something called the chemoreceptor reflex. Okay? So when the blood becomes acidic, both the central and peripheral chemoreceptors they tell the lungs to increase rate and depth of breathing to eliminate that carbon dioxide. Okay, So hopefully that makes sense. And that's what's going to, of course, happen when you go out and exercise. Now, that's something you don't have to think about. That's a normal response, and that's altered breathing. So altered breathing is a normal response. Okay, You don't have to think about it, and it's something that has to happen to rid the body of excess carbon dioxide. But we can also have a couple of homeostatic imbalances. 
And these are hyperventilation and hypoventilation. These are responses by the body not to changes in CO2 levels, but these are something that are signs of something else. Okay, uh, for example, hyperventilation. Okay, the best example I can think about this is a, is a panic attack. Okay, so hyperventilation by definition is an increase in breathing above the body's demand. Okay, so yes, your breathing is altered, but it's not due to changes in CO2 levels. And so what that causes is because your CO2 levels are presumably normal, you increase the breathing rate above the body's demand. Okay. And so what happens in hyperventilation is you get hypocapnia. The reason I specified that this is not due to a change in CO2 levels is because it's important to understand that most likely your CO2 levels are normal. They're at a normal level. They're probably right between 35 and 45. We could even say they're at 40. So if you're hyperventilating, what's happening? You're increasing the rate of breathing and you're getting rid of more CO2. Okay? You're getting rid of too much CO2. And so what's going to happen is you get hypocapnia, which is a term that means a decrease in blood CO2. So with hyperventilation, you're actually getting rid of too much CO2, and your CO2 levels actually drop to abnormal levels. Okay? This is actually bad because it'll actually cause vasoconstriction and decreased oxygen delivery to tissues like the brain. It also causes an increase in blood pH, which is termed respiratory alkalosis. Remember that CO2 equals hydrogen ions. So if you're getting rid of CO2, too much of it, that also gets rid of hydrogen ions. And if you're getting rid of hydrogen ions, the pH goes up in the blood and you end up with something called respiratory alkalosis. And typically when people are hyperventilating, tend to get faint and dizzy, they can lose consciousness, and you can even die from too much hyperventilation. Um, sometimes people get tingling at the mouth um, and also, at, this should actually say fingertips right there, and they'll also get muscle cramps and eventually tetany. Okay, so this is not good. Um, as I mentioned, one of the causes of hyperventilation is simply a panic attack or an anxiety attack, but this can also happen when you have an increase in altitude. And you see this picture right here of this woman actually breathing into a paper bag, and there actually is some science behind why some people do this when they're hyperventilating. So if you think about it, this person is exhaling into this paper bag. So that means all of her carbon dioxide is ending up in the paper bag. So when she inhales, she's actually inhaling that carbon dioxide back into her lungs and back into her blood. So this is actually a kind of ingenious mechanism right here to actually avoid losing as much CO2. So if you were to breathe into a paper bag like this, exhale, you get rid of all this CO2, but then the CO2 is, is inhaled back in. And so this actually offsets the potential hypercapnia, or decrease in blood CO2, that you might have with hyperventilation. Okay. Now we'll briefly talk about hypoventilation. So this is the opposite. This is a decrease in breathing below the body's demand. Okay, so breathing too slowly. When you breathe too slowly, it's called bradypnea. And when you breathe too shallowly, it's called hypopnea. Okay, so you're seeing both slow breathing and shallow breathing. Okay, um, this actually can cause a number of homeostatic imbalances. Um, uh, first of all, it's going to cause hypercapnia. Well, think about it. If you are breathing slower, then you're not actually getting rid of enough carbon dioxide. So even if your carbon dioxide levels were initially normal, not breathing fast enough will cause you to um, not be able to get rid of enough CO2. So you're going to see an increase in blood CO2 and therefore a decrease in blood pH. So hypoventilation actually can cause respiratory acidosis. But there's also effects on oxygen. Remember that if you're hypoventilating, you're also breathing slower and you're also not getting as much oxygen in. So you can actually get what's called hypoxemia, which is a decrease in blood oxygen, and hypoxia, which is a decrease in tissue oxygen. The whole point here is you actually don't get enough oxygen to your body. Okay, But again, you're actually increasing the amount of blood CO2 because you're not getting rid of enough CO2. Breathing gets rid of carbon dioxide. And again, people who are hypoventilating will also get lethargic. They can also have loss of consciousness and have convulsions because their blood is acidifying, and eventually this can kill you as well. Um, some causes of hypoventilation 
Um, for example, muscular disorders or an obstructed airway. Um, if the person has an obstructed airway for whatever reason, let's say COPD, chronic, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, then they may not be able to actually exhale with enough uh, force or get enough air out. And so as a result, they're not going to be eliminating as much carbon dioxide. Um, if, you, if someone has thoracic or abdominal surgery or a collapsed lung, pain, pain can actually cause this. If you have somebody with abdominal surgery, they might find it difficult to breathe or painful to breathe. And so they're obviously going to uh, slow their breathing and they're going to hypoventilate. And so in someone with this condition, you need to monitor their blood pH and CO2 levels. Okay? And also some pain medications such as opioids and sleeping pills like benzodiazepines, these can also cause hypoventilation. So hypoventilation and hyperventilation are really bad. You might be wondering why I put this picture right here. Okay? Um, got a screaming kid right here. Sometimes when kids get really mad and they're throwing a temper tantrum, what they'll do is they'll say, and I've heard this before, uh, I don't have any kids, but I've heard it from other parents, they'll say, oh, I'm, I'm going to hold my breath. I'm going to punish you by holding my breath. You know what you ought to say as a parent? Go for it. So what the kid will do is they'll hold their breath, and one of two things will happen. They'll either pass out and immediately regain consciousness and start breathing, or they'll have to breathe. Why is that? Because if you're holding your breath, that's a conscious hypoventilation. What happens with hypoventilation? You're not getting rid of CO2, so the blood CO2 is increasing and you're acidifying your blood and you're causing respiratory acidosis. So at some point, you'll either pass out and immediately start breathing again, or your body systems will just override you not breathing and you'll force yourself to breathe. So if a kid tries to hold their breath to punish the parent, they're not really hurting you or themselves. So anyway, hopefully this video made sense and you understand a little bit about hypoventilation, hyperventilation, and then the mechanisms of altered breathing. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.